Hey guys, Robert here, and I have today returning for the first time in a long while, Philip Kennedy Johnson. What's up, Robert? Good to see you again. Good to see you again, too. When you were last on here, you were just starting your Superman run, if I recall. Like, you had just, you did your Future State, and I think you had just done the first couple of issues. I don't think you, you didn't start War World yet. Okay, so it would have been the Future State stuff, probably. Yeah, and I gotta say, with the War World saga to, over and done with, I loved it. That ending... I mean, seriously, I have not felt this strongly about Superman in a long time, and I, I think this is going, going, this is going to go down as a modern classic. Oh, thank you so much for saying that, man. It's been a real honor, and I, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, they, I mean, they let me do what I wanted to do. It's it, it, went, it went long, and they, they let me do this really awesome long form story with a ton of characters and mm-hmm. develop War World into this like much more, you know, expansive like lore rich kind of place and get into Mongols history and. Yep. I'm really excited they let me do all that stuff. And now I'm honestly, I'm just as excited to get back home now too. There's all these characters I haven't really gotten right very much yet. And now so right. we're getting to bring them back home. And yeah, I'm, I'm really stoked for how it went and, and how it's going next. Yep. And speaking of which now, obviously you didn't create this Mongo. Bendis had created this one right beforehand, but you knew exactly where to take him pretty much. Um, I mean, cause as, you call him the Mongol who lives, right? right Mongol who is. is like the way they yeah, the way they differentiate between between the different Mongol because it's I mean it's a it's a title, right? Like Mongol means strongest or did back when the first Mongol came around in their language it meant strongest. Um, so now it's a, it's a name that gets passed on to whoever kills the father and becomes the next Mongol. Right. Um, so they differentiate between Mongol who is and Mongol right. who was. Like all like every Mongol who's ever been right. is, is referred to as Mongol who was. So and they, they, yeah. they pray to him like God. Like even though there's been, you know, a thousand, however, however many more Mongols in the past, right. they pray to them as if it's just one. Right. Now, as far as with how you've handled I mean, with with Mongol, given his past history. Are you just keeping the new 52 stuff canon or did, is there still like, which Mongol would you say was the Mongol that was involved with Coast City? Was that the one Mongol that was, or I'm just trying to figure out the continuity for Mongol. Yeah. It's in my mind, the Mongol that we're, the Mongol that we saw in the events of War World Saga is the third that, that Superman has seen. Mm-hmm. Um, when he first met Mongol way back in the day. Yep. That was the first and uh, his first and right. uh, not the first, but um, that was the first time we'd seen Mongol as readers. Mm-hmm. And then there was a, his son after that. Right. And that son is the one that the current Mongol murdered in Bendis's mm-hmm. run. Right. And All right. The third is the one. The third is the one that we've been seeing. And now he's dead, too. But right. We've seen a lot of life and death get get messed with on War World Saga. And you know, when, Kr- when Krillux leaves War World at the end, gets away, mm-hmm. he takes the body with him. Right. He, he even says to somebody, um, he you know he he kind of phones in to uh, he FaceTimes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I he, represent uh, the people who recall what your betrayal and all that. Yeah, yeah, and he even he even says in that call he says, uh, "Mongol's dead for now." <laughs> for now. <laughs> but, <laughs> nice. But has, nice. Yep. Yeah, but he has he has uh, he has plans for him anyway. Right, but um, but yeah, now. As far as this whole, and first of all, when it came to Future State, obviously the events of, we're supposed to take in that the events of Superman being off planet happened later in the time, I'm assuming, right? Give it how that was like a bit in the future and things played out differently compared to what, okay, let me rephrase that. How would you say things played out differently in Future State compared to what actually happened in the events? Because there's always been a point of divergence. So where things played out differently, what would you say was the point of divergence in yeah, the main timeline. Well, I mean, I intended for this story to be able to fit right into ah. into the events of of the War World Saga. The future All state right. worlds of war could have could have gone right in there. The only right. difference is that this the only difference really that that kind of breaks it apart is something I didn't write. Mm-hmm. And if you like in the I think in the little intro at the beginning of Worlds of War, there's a little um narrative paragraph or something that's, that basically just kind of sets up what future state is yep and um at some point i think it says something about being 10 years in the future or something something like that yeah and i never wrote that <laughs> and that oh. we, we actually we actually had not discussed it mm-hmm. um so 
I think camera was ten years or five years. I think it's. I think it ended up being printed as ten Some, years. Something like something like that. And they eventually came up with a timeline of what each what each issue fit in in the chronology yeah, and all that. that was, like that, Wonder Woman was the furthest in the future and all that. Right. And, yeah, I had no say in that. In that all document. right. And so, and I, um, and in my in my head canon, that's not the case. All right. Um. So the um the events of the future state story where. You know, so on Earth, everyone knows that Clark Kent is Superman and right. um, uh, Smallville has kind of become like a kitschy kind of like a Roswell type yep. tour- touristy place. Mm-hmm. And this girl goes to kind of honor the memory of Superman. They all kind of talk about where they think he is and everything. And we see where he actually is. And he's, you know, mm-hmm. he's getting dragged through the mud and war world fighting for his life and for the life of his allies. Right. That that could have happened. In my mind, that happened right around issue um, 1030 nine or 40 right so around the um uh, the midway midish point oh no sorry Toward, towards the yeah. end of the arena issue right the, exactly the, uh that the book is yeah, called the right arena here. yeah right exactly right i got them all the, right here with me i got them all oh, right great. here with me. thanks dude yep. yeah I, either in that issue or the one like the couple after that like the um mm-hmm. the arc that's called the arena was supposed to be called war world colon arena like war world arena mm-hmm. that's that's the uh, the arc in which that all kind of happens because he's still in right. the he's still in the uh, the arena and has not yet like the rebellion is not fully formed right yet. exactly and obviously then you also have House of L which I take it there's still some stuff you haven't tapped into with this right because yeah obviously it's not tied into the War World stuff I think you have stuff is this going to be one of those cases where you're going to always jump back and forth to this eventually like you did with the annual I don't know man I um. I was really happy with that annual and with the story you're holding there. Mm-hmm. I am. Um, and I really want to come back to them. Um, yeah. we're, still kind of, we're still kind of sorting out how to do it exactly. Right. But I, I know I want to, uh, at this point, there's so many things I want to do. It's I'm kind of like becoming, I'm not comparing <laughs> myself to Guillermo del Toro, except that he, has, <laughs> he, he always has this laundry list of stuff that he wants to do. Right. He's <laughs> like, I'm going to make this movie and this movie and this movie. And if he were to actually get, if he were to actually make all the movies he has talked about making, he, he would have to live to be a thousand years old. Exactly. Um, so I, I also have a ton of things I want to do with Superman. And I mean, I don't know. Nobody knows how long I'm going to be on the book. It's already been almost two years. Mm-hmm. So they're always going to shake up creative teams and um, it's kind of up to them how long I'm on the book. But I, if I get to, if I get to stick around for a lot, you know, for as long as I want to, right. we, will, we will absolutely bring out the house of L again. And hopefully not just a one-off, but like a legit mm-hmm. way. Definitely. And, um, well, I was, I know I said it before during our last interview, but it bears repeating. One thing I did like when you started off with the golden age was how, now I'm not trying to bash Bendis. I'm just simply saying there were some issues with how some of the writing went, like how he would sometimes have it be, John seemed to accept things too easily and how people are saying, oh, you're Superman. You're the real Superman. Your dad was just the, you know, like, when are you going to become the real Superman? I liked how you actually showed John having that get to him. I mean, again, I did, it just felt natural. I'm not, again, I'm not taking pot shots. I'm just saying when I saw that, then led into this, this made me accept what Bendis did a lot better by having a writer put it more into context and calling, you know, be like, I didn't like them saying that. Why were they saying that to me? Things like that. And I really did appreciate this whole idea of, yeah, the, you know, the whole idea of this golden age where you think your parents are invincible. Yeah, thank you. I mean, part of that was driven that that arc, the Golden Age arc, mm-hmm. was uh, was driven in part by uh, the artist. The fact that Phil Hester was doing the art, I love Phil Hester's style. Oh, yeah. it's, it's this really beautiful, streamlined kind of like. I mean, it's not like he. I mean, the we use the term Golden Age to refer mm-hmm. to that time, like a really long time ago, right? And that's not that's. I mean, Phil's work doesn't look like that, but it's. Oh no but it does have a really timeless kind of quality that I really admire. And um, it just felt like a good fit for this kind of a story, you know, like this, uh, like a, you know, like it's coming of age story between him and his son and something that exists not outside of the timeline because it's still, you know, the, the main characters and all that, but so just a quick two, uh, two parter mm-hmm. the, with, with an art style like Phil. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just really wanted to tell that kind of a book, a book that would tee up, that would help tee up um, 
what Tom Taylor was about to do. Right. John, to kind of kind of show between that and then the one who fell issues right after that, just kind of right. set up John as someone who could potentially really do this. Exactly. And now, funny enough, you, yeah, you mentioned that the one who fell and all that, because that was also a good, you know, very good arc. Again, just constantly setting up John. And I think I've been loving what Tom Taylor's been doing. And I do feel, and he's openly admitted, of course, that they rushed him to get John and Jay together and everything. And I do think that's kind of stumbled things a bit. I mean, what are you going to do when editorial tells you that, right? But I do feel John has been a great character and him and Superman father and son being together. That's why I cannot wait for what you guys are going to be doing with the return of Cal al and everything. Like, I just, I can't wait for that. And with the stuff, especially what's been announced for 1050, the stuff was Lex Luthor. I mean, to be honest, Tom's been building up Lex uh, pretty much. And was that planned out? Yeah, it was. Like Tom's got, Tom had his own plans for, um, for Lex. Um, I had my own as well, but mine were further out. Like it was, there was plenty of room for him to do what he wanted to do and still, because, you know, I'm just now getting to my stuff um, Mm -hmm. and involved Lex. Lex is still kind of in the background in my arc. Right. And then we have, we definitely have big plans for Lex coming up next year. Um, So, Mm -hmm. yeah, it was all, we we talk a lot, actually. I talked to Tom quite a bit and uh, throughout the Dark Crisis stuff, Josh has been on Lex a lot too. I've been talking to Josh a good bit. We all, we all have primarily the same editor and Paul Kaminsky and we're all talking a lot. Funny you mentioned Dark Crisis because I love this issue as well, the Green Lantern one. And well, thank you. I rem- remember when you were on Word Balloon, you were talking about how you had talked with Jeffrey Thorne about all that. And yeah, just just to know that, because I still remember ha- having him on as well. Both me and Nerdette have had him on. And how he said, oh yeah, I talked to at least one person who got it, who really got, got it with it. And I'm pretty sure he was talking about you, just this, oh, well, taking what be- he had. Yep. That's yeah, kind. I, I hope. Yeah, I hope. I hope he feels that way. I, I definitely felt that way about him. I mean, he's right. like, Jeffrey. Just understands uh, John in a way that I didn't, frankly. Like I, I've only seen. I mean, I remember stories that I have that have John in it, John Stewart back in a, back in the day when which he's an architect. Right. Had a, those are a, you know, besides being a little a little dated because it was a long time ago. Right. Um, I like the idea that he's an architect. And oh yeah, I love that too. Yeah, whenever I see him in more modern takes, he is pre- sometimes military. Like, they go with the military guy. Yeah, they they really, in my opinion, make him a little bit one note sometimes, where he's the, yeah. the ex marine, and that's that kind of colors every word he says, and it's kind of how he bear, how he holds himself and all that. And it's it makes sense in that he is a leader of soldiers. He is a natural born leader. There are things about him that in which that fits. But there are other aspects that you don't uh, ever get to know about him. And I just, I grew up with Hal as, mm-hmm. as Green Lantern. That's always kind of in, my ha- in my heart of hearts. I always kind of see him. Well, him and and also Kyle. Right. Um, it was. Although for really, me, I always loved Guy, to be honest. <laughs> I never did, man. I never got into Guy. Oh. Yeah, I just, I mean, part of it is I, I don't think I ever had. I mean, my, my exposure to those comics was, was I'm sure, much more limited than yours. And I, I never really had right. access to a lot of Guy comics that I liked. I right. mean, the first time I remember seeing Guy was in um, uh, whatever the arc was called, where where uh, Hal was in prison and, and Guy was his role. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. He, it's he, been he, a wasn't while. At, he wasn't at all like the, the guy that we come to know later. Like he was. Oh, yeah. When it started thought, off, yeah. He talked about like I have these anger issues. And I'm trying to keep them under control, and he's like this very straight laced lawyer. It has nothing yeah. to do with the guy at all, really. No. He's a lawyer. That's one thing I loved when I reread a while back through the Wa the Super Buddies story. I don't know if you ever read those. The Demetrius Giffen Maguire's reunion with the Justice League. To the point where he even says, "I'm a lawyer," and everyone's like, "What?" Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't think he's a lawyer. I, mean, I think they've since retconned that he's more. He's been a cop, and then and then became a lawyer. And all that because of his dad. Yeah, yeah. There was yeah, they went through some changes. But I um but yeah. So later so when I saw when I saw a guy later on yeah. as a Green Lantern had the bowl cut and all that, I was like, this like what what happened? Like this is, I just I remember yeah. the very different version. My first but, time seeing him was during the um Death War was out and Return of Superman stuff. Him dealing with the eradicator and just being all like, Oh yeah, that's the good that's the real Superman. And then when and they came back. Okay, so I picked the wrong one. Get off my back. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, he um so yeah, so I grew up with Hal and right. I really like the the kind of dark horse quality to him where he was 
he was constantly getting underestimated by the other Green Lanterns, like, ah, oh, this human kid's never going to make it. And, like, he just yep. he didn't seem like a great fit, and he went on to become one of the greatest of all time, and I love that. <laughs> um, but I didn't feel like I knew John as well. Um, right. So I, I knew that, I mean, Jeffrey just loves that character. Yeah. And I felt like knew him as well as anyone ever, ever has. So reach out to Jeffrey and wanted to talk to him at, at length about that. And <laughs> Jeffrey talked my ass off about John and I deeply appreciated it. It was like, gave me a really good conversation about, um, I mean, talked about his origins and all that. I, I knew a lot of, the, I knew a lot of his history about John's history, but what I really wanted to know was who he felt like John was at his core. Like to, like if you were going to sum up that character, who is he? Like, what's he, what's he want? Where does he come from? What is he afraid of? And, um, yeah, he just gave me a lot of great insights into who John is. And I really kind of fell in love with the character through that conversation and then kind of writing him after that, like taking what I learned from Jeffrey mm -hmm. and writing him after that. Um, I really, I got to know John in a really cool way, man. That's one of the reasons I love doing like licensed superhero books or any, any kind of licensed gig right. because I get to fill these holes in my game. Mm -hmm. like where I, you know, a character that I, <laughs> my first ever DC gig was actually an Aquaman thing. Oh, really? Um, That's why I'm that. It was an annual. I want to say 2018, oh. maybe. Oh, I have that. I don't have it with me, but I know it's somewhere in my in somewhere in one of these shelves. <laughs> yeah, I think on the cover, I think they they called it "What Dreams May Come" or something. I like, think that I wasn't, saw that. Yeah, that was I not the title. I, was, I didn't give it that title. It's just kind of what it, what right. it ended up on the book. Mm -hmm. But um. Yeah, so I so Brian Cunningham, who was at the time the Justice League editor, reached out like, "Hey, would you want to just, I re, I read this creator own book of yours. Would you want to do stuff for us?" And he gave me a list of the different um, books that he was doing. It's like, let's see, I'm doing. What did he say? He said Flash, Aquaman, maybe a Green Lantern thing, uh, Hellblazer, a couple of others, and I was like, Hellblazer all day. Right. Yeah, I, I have read every word that dude's ever spoken in a comic. And he yep. said, actually, what I really need is Aquaman. <laughs> oh, then why did you give him why did why give the option? I know. And I was like, that's what I meant. I meant Aquaman. Let's do Aquaman. I love that character. And I <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't know Aquaman all that well, really. And it was, I um I knew him from like the super friends back in the day, <laughs> but I didn't really know him. I certainly didn't know his current status quo. Um, right. I heard good things about the Jeff Johns run. Mm-hmm. So I started there. I started with the trench arc and everything that came mm -hmm. after that. And then I went back and I read a lot of pre new 52 stuff or like sub Diego and. Sub Diego. Oh yeah. Will Pfeiffer's era. Yeah. And the old, like the justice league stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the one handed era. Oh yeah. Era. Peter David's run. Yeah, and right. all that. So got to know him a lot. And I just found a way to love that character. Like I really figured out what my take of Aquaman is, why I think he's awesome and what I wanted him to be and do. Right. Um, and that's, that's why I really, that's, that's the, probably the biggest reason why I really value these kinds of, I'm doing another one of those stories now, a story in which I was kind of ignorant of the source material and I got to do a ton of research and really fall in love with the character in a way that I just didn't before. So it's, it's, they're really great for that. Nice. Speaking also with Dark Crisis, how did it feel to be working with Daniel Sampier for the first bunch of, um, the stop books before he had to go off and do Dark Crisis? That was awesome. I mean, I didn't. No, I don't think either one of us knew that that was going to happen. Right. Like we, I mean, I, um, Jamie Rich pitched Daniel to me. He's like, what do you think about this guy for the, uh, for the interiors? Mm. And I looked him up. I mean, Jamie sent me some samples of his work and the samples he had sent me was, is from his latest stuff, mm -hmm. which, it, which at that time was the future state Aquaman thing. Right. Um, and it looked incredible. I mean, really great. And then yeah. I was like, but I didn't want to just take his best stuff that somebody else is trying to use to sell him on mm -hmm. to sell him to me. So I went back and looked at his other issues too. And they were also great. Um, yeah. I, whenever I'm looking at a new artist, I want, I, I have to look, I have to see their worst pages as well as their best. You know, like I want to see right. where the, where the ceiling where the weaknesses are. are. Yeah. Yeah. See what, you know, how they tend to handle layouts and where they, where they really shine. Mm -hmm. um, not not just to judge them like is this person good enough or whatever, but right, also right. just but figure out how I'm going to write for this person. Like where where are their strengths? Mm -hmm. And what impressed me the most about Daniel was how much 
like he, I mean, he was still getting better. Like he was, I, I, he really, I mean, every, I didn't see a bad book in the, in any of the stuff that I well, saw. Me neither. Yeah. But what I saw was like every, every story on, I could just watch the, the calendar go by and watch him get better and better and better on every issue. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, dude, we need this guy. He's incredible. So yeah. it worked, worked out awesome. I was really sorry to lose him for Dark Crisis, but he's doing great work there too. Oh yeah, he's doing phenomenal work. And that's one thing I will get, I get props for DC is they have been getting, they've been starting to regain a lot of the top tier talent. There was like that brief time where it was like hit and miss with some of the talent at DC for a while, but it feels like they've regained that title of we have the top tier talent, the top tier writers again. Yeah, I, yeah. The people I'm, that we're working with at, at DC right now are just yeah. just killing it. I mean, they're everyone's really energized, turning in great stories. Um, yep. There's this, and the editors too. I mean, the um, I feel like the editors feel very invested in the stories, and you know, mm -hmm. keeping keeping the characters true to who they are and everything, but also trying new stuff all the time. And which I appreciate. Yeah, big yeah, time. Yeah, it's a really really cool time at DC right now creatively. Yep. Now. When it came to the now, I know you didn't write this portion, but you know Grant Moore's and stuff with Superman the Authority. Were you told you had to incorporate that in there, or like how I wasn't that told. I mean, no, nobody really told me. It's like here's this, you know here's the stuff you're stuck with. It wasn't anything like that. Right, and right. It wasn't that way with the Bend of stuff either. Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like to to just kind of pretend that it didn't happen or. Again, this is again. This is talking about Bendis's run as well as oh right, Grant, right as well as well as Grant's mini. Um, to just pretend that none of that stuff had happened and just kind of start over, just felt very um, disrespectful to the readers. I guess the readers who are invested in Superman and read right. every month, every Superman book every month, and all that. I really don't like think it's, <laughs> it's supposed. Yeah, it's supposed to feel like one long epic that just kind of never ends, right? And I I want right. to make sure that. That we're you know, like a like a jazz solo. Make sure you're taking the themes that, you know, the themes of the last chorus to carry you through the next chorus, and then the one after that. Just keep developing the ideas as they go, and not just start over. Right. So I am um, when we were figuring it out, like when I when I first conceived of the War World saga, or how well I mean the the idea was pitched to me, kind of right. and basically. You know, what do you think about Superman and War World? It's like is that's like <laughs> the extent of the pitch. Right. And then from there, I. I wrote it out, you know, from that, from that idea. Um, I did not know I was going to have the authority with me up there and mm -hmm. I conceived of it as being just him. Um, when I wrote like the future state stuff and everything else, but then when, when right. it became clear that it was going to come right after Grant's run and it was going to be this team book and everything, it felt really, it felt like a misstep to just ignore the team that Grant right. had just built. You know, right. Grant just had Superman put together this whole thing. And yeah, that started out as a 5G idea. Right. But, but now it's not a 5G idea. So it's a thing that Superman was doing in the pages of modern continuity. And there had to be a reason for it. Like, why would he do that? If right. John if John is going to be the Superman of Earth in Superman's absence, why would he build this team to like take his place yeah. on Earth? Like he's, he's building the team because he needs them. And right. it made sense to me that he would be bringing them with him to War World because he knew, he knew that he had lost a step. Right after um, the uh, the Golden Age events, yeah, yeah, and exactly, and that was all written in part because of Grant the needs of Grant's right. miniseries. The fact that Superman had lost a step as far as his powers, mm -hmm. that's why, as part of the reason he developed the Authority. And so, I mean, that wouldn't make sense, nor would it make sense for him to be a gladiator, right? Um, in on World if he had all his powers. Yep. Um. So that was all. A lot of the decisions that I made regarding the team. And regarding mm -hmm. Superman's powers and all that stuff, that, that was all to to kind of to go hand in hand with what Grant was doing right. in, in the Authority book. Which also reminds me again from, again from another bit, one of your word balloon interviews because I remember Grant had brought up about the whole idea of oh Superman was going to become more conservative, but eventually you was I don't think the question was brought up, but through talking about the stuff with five G, you said you were going to do a take on Superman Red and Blue, and I soon realized. Oh, Grant was just talking about one half of that idea when it was going to be the case of, oh, red and blue representing two extremes going, you know, at each other. And yeah, Grant, Grant had talked about he yeah, uh Grant had talked about in his uh in his substack mentioned um an idea that he was gonna develop in the authority miniseries in which um Superman was split into like a libertarian Superman and a basically a communist Superman. 
Right. Um, and he, <laughs> Grant said in that in that um, that blog is like Philip visibly recoiled when I said that. <laughs> and <laughs> I was I was sorry to read that. I was like, I mean, it's true. I didn't love the idea. I'm sorry it was so obvious, but I. Um, right. The reason that I, I mean, I'm not going to tell Grant shit about how to do this. Oh, right, right, right. You know, Grant's a legend. Big and, time, yeah. You know, a massive influence on me personally. Mm -hmm. um, but the story that we were doing on War World was very much about like human trafficking. And he's, mm -hmm. it's, there's such a clear mission statement of like right. liberating this planet from a, from a intergalactic <laughs> slaver. You yeah. Know? And if we were having, uh, Grant was thinking of having that, uh, the two Superman thing carry into continuity after that. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I feel like that would, I feel like that idea was going to kind of suck all the air out of the room Yeah, um, it would as, as far as the theme, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of figured out a way to do it where it would be, um, the idea would be wrapped up by the end of the authority run. And then they ended up granted I'm not using it, but right. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone, everyone, when, you, when you see a, when you see different, sometimes you'll see a draft of Grant's um, story arc, mm -hmm. and then the next time you see it, it's wildly different. Like he's right. Grant, Grant is such an yeah. insanely creative person. Definitely. That um, one of my idols too. One of my many comic idols. Yeah, I mean, and, and rightfully so. Um, when they, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I don't know if they would have stuck with that idea or not in the long run. Right. Um, Without that, without without that meeting, but I know right. that, that it was not the only idea that, that suddenly appeared in a in a draft, and then the following draft it was very different. Right, I just bring it up because I just remember there was that point where everyone dwelled on that thing. Oh, they were going to make him an extreme conservative, and all. It's like that doesn't make sense. And then now, that, but once you put it in the context, I'm like, that makes more sense. Why do people have to try and skew it to make it politic more political than? Well, um, yeah. Well, I mean, there was a there was a take that preceded Grant's in which oh. um, Dio, oh. as I, as I as I understand it, mm -hmm. Dio pitched to like when they when five G was still going to be happening, mm -hmm. Dio pitched this thing in which Superman, you know, and, right. and a much older Superman has become kind of a, more of an auth um, authoritarian. authoritarian. Yeah. So the word conservative was never really used. It was more. Right. Like a, almost like a, like a dictator kind of a character. Right. Exactly, but bleeding cool or someone whoever twisted it to make everyone outraged, and there, that's all she wrote. Ah. Yeah, well, I can't speak to that, but I, but yeah, right. initially the the idea of the Dio's was that uh, we would see an authoritarian Superman mm -hmm. using the authority as like his his personal like team, Ooh. and gotcha. uh, and Grant was like. That's not no. really who Superman is, and exactly. um, and then it kind of it became, you know, right. what, yeah. it, it became what Grant wanted to do with the Authority, right? And now one thing I want to also ask: with the Batman the Authority book, was this meant to be Tempest and uh, Fuginet, and is he dead? It is not Tempest Fuginet, no, and he oh. is dead. That that character is dead. Okay, it's one of his um, people, though, right? That's one of the other Fuginots, yeah. Right, that's what I thought because that just got me worried. I'm like. Please tell me he's not dead because I like Tempest. He's kind of their watcher. Yeah, no, he is. It's there are other Fuguenots out there, mm -hmm. and uh, that one is dead as hell. <laughs> yeah, definitely big time cut right in half. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, that was like that. I think that was uh, Batman's source. Like Batman had a, a Fuguenot as a source, mm -hmm. and then at some point they they go off grid and real and we realize what's happened. They've like used the body as a you know, a gate, you know? Right. But yeah, but then came the big twist with 1036 and how you basically revealed just how much you've been planning up to this point, you know, with the authority and all that. This is where all the context was given that I don't think any of us saw coming until this issue. And how was that to have some people actually be caught off guard by that? Oh, thanks. It was, uh, <laughs> we were kind of twisting ourselves in knots how to make, because I mean, again, Grant's, um, Grant's creativity cannot like knows no bounds and will right. not will not be contained. Right. And it was so it was such a different take on Superman than than what we were seeing in the pages of action and and you know and the uh, the John book as well. Mm -hmm. Um 
and we had to find a way to bring it back into modern continuity because there was going to be a, t a way before there was a time in which it was not supposed to be in the same continuity ah. and um that was you know a long time ago right but then when when grant said no no this is this is going to be this is actual like modern day in continuity superman then we had to figure some shit out right. I, mean, was, I mean i'm not going to tell grant no Right, right. And he's one, of those, he's one of those creators who kind of earned that spot up. You're not going to tell him. Totally. That. No, completely. And, and you know, Grant really wanted the story to, to count, like to not just be something that gets erased. Like, oh, just kidding. It's an um, alternate universe. Um, so, you know, so how do we do that? We got a Superman who's weaker. We got a Superman who, is, who looks clearly older. Mm -hmm. um, we got this other team. Um, there, like, there's, you know, a page in which, you know, he can barely fly. Right. Meanwhile, in in my book, he's kicking all kinds of ass. And yeah, he right. is he is poisoned. You know, he's a radiation poison, but he's also doing awesome shit still. Right. Um. So we had to figure out a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. And there were there were different ideas getting kicked around. And at some point, I I brought out the idea to someone to editorial. I was like, "What if it's all an illusion?" And part of the reason he gets his team together is because he needs to keep up appearances, and it's actually part of it's like a big show, so that the so that his enemies. Mm -hmm. do not realize that he is that he is rapidly losing a step like we see it seated in 1030 where he's right um, batman and adam are kind of measuring his energy output and seeing right. how you know how powerful it actually is and then we kind of leave that thread alone for a long time let people kind of forget about it right and then 1036 we realize no he's been he's been rapidly declining since then we just haven't known it and when you've been reading the superman of the authority you're actually seeing him at the same time right and like, you know, Enchantress and Manchester Black are kind of just covering it up and using the other characters to do this crazy shit he can do now. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it was it was a big juggling act to make it all to make it all work together in a way that felt earned and not like the like the readers didn't feel like they were being, you know, jerk around. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, when I read it, I was like Oh shit! I didn't understand. Like, I would have the Superman the Authority book off separately at first, because like, I'm just like, "How is this going to fit? How is this? What's the point of this?" And then once I saw it, I'm like, "Oh, okay." So ever since that, I've been having it right next to, you know, right in my folder as you can file, as you can see, because it was became just as important. So I kept it in that pile, and. Yeah, and then once you go into the rest of the War of War saga, I mean, for one, the artwork. Oh, good Lord, the artwork in a good way. I mean, it's just incredible, especially once, um, how do you say the name? Federici? Um, Ricardo, Ricardo Federici. Yeah, once he got involved, he kept on having that, um, oh, geez, who's that classic artist? Did all those big type of artwork? Um, oh, geez. Uh, Bernie Wrightson? No, not Wrightson. Um, Fragoda, not Fragoda. Uh, it, it, oh, Frank it, Rosetta. I think so. Yeah, like the like the Conan and yeah, the, that's the right. Edgar yeah, that's covers right. yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. Right. that's the way it was kept giving that vibe of. Was that intentional? Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. He was he was a perfect choice. I mean, yeah. I mean, Daniel obviously was just just he came up. Daniel Semperi had this just perfect iconic Superman that like the coolest thing about that Superman that Daniel did was that he looks like. He looks like the Superman of every era. Yes, exactly. That's one thing I would definitely be, agree with. I mean, it's the same. It's the same Superman that we were reading in the Kurt Swan days, and the same one that we were yeah. reading in the, you know, Ivan Reese days, and Frank Quietly, and you know, John Byrne, and they're like it's all the same guy. And it gets, somehow, somehow, he manages to to pay homage to all those artists in that one design. It was so definitely. cool. Definitely. Um, then when Ricardo comes around, like he came on board for for those classic. Um, you know, sword and sandals kind of issues. Yeah. And they're just, yeah, they're just so, that's just what he's born to do, you know? Yep. I say this was my favorite cover, by the way, the S and chains. That oh, was my thanks. favorite. Yeah. That was my favorite cover. And yeah, that was cool. That was Daniel's too. Yep. And um, when it came to, I guess it was Omek. Omek was definitely the one character that I kept on. Didn't know what to think of with it because Grant graded, graded them. And then, you were the one who kind of expanded on them more. And I just, I would just found their whole arc fascinating, you know, just this whole, this new character and lose someone close to them and is wanting to do whatever it takes to bring them back. And then realizes they, what they should have realized at first, but they were so blinded by their grief 
this is not what you want, and then it does whatever they can to undo the damage. Yeah, thanks. I, it was a really interesting character, and I, I mean, in our in my conversations with Grant, I know more about Omax Origins, and they're super cool. And I, right. I really wish that there was a there was a place in that arc that where I could get into that. So there wasn't really. I don't want to. I didn't want to sell Omax Origins short by just kind of, you know, finding a little corner for it. It really needs its own like you know, room right. to breathe, but that character is awesome. And we're, we're talking right now about how to, how to um, bring him back, how to bring the character back, how to bring the, like the authority back in a way that will, right. you know, make, make Omax um, origins clear and like make more of their arc clear. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's, they're really, really cool. Um, cool character. And I gotta say also the annual, the stuff was Ma Kent. Actually, I mean, that she's a cancer survivor. I never saw it coming. And the way, I know I said it before to you on Word Bullet and in one of the comments, but the fact that you took that and made a way that made it fit, it didn't feel shoehorned. It felt natural. It felt like it actually belongs in there now. And it just, because some of the writers that do it, there's a good chance you could botch it. You know, it's a very easy thing to botch. But with here, you just made it work and explained that, oh, yeah, there was this time where she had cancer. She, went through chemo and all that and eventually was able to be a survivor and come through it all and by the time this was when Clark was young and all that stuff was that bully and by the end of it all he's doing better for you know and everything just this is Superman for me this is one of the best Superman stories I've read in a long time in one issue was this. Oh thank you man I mean it's I gotta give Cy Spurrier credit for most of that you just said mm -hmm. he, I mean Cy, Cy and I co-wrote that issue mm -hmm. and Sai had the idea of making it about the mothers. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of father and son stuff, including in my own work. There's a lot of father and son. Right. But one thing that we had not explored enough of on, well, I mean, almost nothing uh, up to that point was uh, the idea, like where are all the women on war world, like the, the, right. war, zoom, the war zoom women. Right. And I knew I wanted to show that. And when Sai, like we were talking about what to do with the annual, I was really underwater work wise too. And mm -hmm. um, uh, my editor, Paul, was like, what if we had, let's just give this one to Cy. I just recently introduced Cy to Paul and like, let's just right. let Cy do this. And I'm like, I, uh, I can't really do that because I really, there's this backstory with Mongol that we've got to show <laughs> right. um, on War World. We've got, that's, that's the annual is our chance to do that. Um, but Cy came on board to write. We made it like this kind of mirror yep. thing where back you see, forth, you see forth, both, yeah. both of them in their formative years. We see Clark Kent at an age where they they're developing their powers a little bit, but they're they're at this kind of pivotal moment where they could be, become kind of ordinary, like using right. using his powers to you know like anyone would to kind of punish a bully, right? And kind of a kind of a petty way. Mm -hmm. um, but his mom course corrects him and you know leads him on a path to becoming exceptional. Exactly. And meanwhile, we see Mongol as a young man, as a as a kid at an age where he is starting to actually show a little bit of compassion, which also is a shameful thing on, on his world. And his mom course corrects him into being more savage, more ruthless, and, right? Yeah. Trying to teach him how to survive in, a, in an environment like that, because that's the war zone does not protect. Right. Um, so we learn a lot more about the war zone culture in that issue, but we also learn a lot more about Superman as a young kid and how their mothers shape both of them. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, the fact you have this bully who knocks over, you know, um, um, Martha's wig and all that. And afterwards, by the end, he, you know, the way he, once he improves, he actually does improve and become an inspiration and all that. Just again, that's the only thing, the, if there was ever one word to describe Superman, it's inspiration. If you had yeah. to only put down to one word, it would be inspiration. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah. And now, of course, you have then the last couple of issues leading up to the War World Apocalypse one shot. But first, I want to talk about the backups. Bringing back um, Conduit. I adore Conduit. I think he's been one of those guys, one, his design, it's so 90s, but that type of 90s, that's timeless 90s. You know what I mean? That yeah, type exactly. It's not, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like... 
Uh, not to talk shit about live film, but when I think '90s, yeah. I think about like cable, you know, like like yeah, just, cable pouches and all that. Yeah, as as muscled out as you could potentially ever be, like pouches yeah. everywhere, like guns are stuck to you, and like it's just like just. I know it, for him, they made it work. For him, cable, it worked. For yeah, anyone exactly. else, no, it's just cable, like, cable is like '90s personified, right? Exactly, but kind of like yeah. the other side of that, where it's like sleek and smooth and cool looking and. Still 90s, though. Still very 90s, yeah, like exactly. you that these days, but all this wires and all that. But now, how do you explain how he's back? Or is this a case where he never died in this in this uh, uh, chain of events? Cause... The idea is that he never died. I mean, this is, of all course, right. this is all this is all post New 52. So everything there's a New 52 gives us a little bit of leeway. That's what I saw. It. That's what I saw. Um, it. So, yeah, in this in this version of things, Conduit has been off the map for a long time. He's another one of those bad guys that kind of got put in prison, forgot about like we that right. happens all the time in comics where these they yep. kind of, they've been in, the, you know, they've been, somebody's been keeping them in the hole in the ground until yep. until they're needed by somebody. In this case, mm-hmm. Michael Waller, like, hey, we got this thing that we need and you've got you kind of got experience with this. So go do this thing yep. for us. Exactly, and i just so glad to see him back because I know Jurgen said he wanted to bring him back if he had done, like, his plan for 1001 before Bendis came in was to bring Conduit back. So that always felt like when he said that, I was like, oh, darn it. But once you brought him back, I was like, yes, because yeah, he's the villain, who's the villain who, yes, he had a story to tell, and they killed him off at the end because, let's be honest, was that story, that was the only way you could go with that story. You really couldn't go anywhere else with him which made it such a disappointment because you want him back. But now that you've brought him back, it's like, yes, he's not stuck in that death, guaranteed death thing, so we can use him more. Yeah, no, he's he's back on the table, and like we can we can get him out again and use him. The fact that you know he and Waller kind of have this relationship now, Yep, I feel like he would be a prime candidate for like a, for a, a squad kind of, kind of book. Exactly. And then, again, you have the, the end of it all, the war world apocalypse. And seriously, this was just so great. And the fact that everyone kept saying, oh, he's changing Superman's powers and all that. And then when I read this, I'm like, that ain't what happened, guys. Where were you getting your information from? Yeah. So were people saying that we're changing his powers? That's what people were saying. They're saying they're changing the source. And it was that whole BS of trying to say, oh, they're changing his source of power so they can get around copyright and not pay off the oh, yeah, yeah. Super- that yeah. whole thing. It's like, where I mean, did they ever think they were going to change its powers? You were just trying to get them this other source and everything, this power source, but he was not saying that Superman was going to use it. So we were, okay, so the, the assumption was that we were going to use the fire of Olgren and that was going to be the yes. second foul from then on? Exactly. Yeah, no, that was, kind of, that was kind of a misdirection. I wanted to, I wanted him to have access to this crazy power that would have made him greater than ever, but um, in the end, he refuses to use it. He uses it instead to save the life of a nobody. Exactly. Exactly. You know, like that was that was always kind of the point. That's that's always been the point of Superman's powers to me. Like, yes, it's, it's just to show how how incorruptible he is. He had this power in his hand that could have made him, you know, an actual living god. Yep. And he uh, he squanders it to save the life of a kid who nobody knows. Exactly. You know? And then and and Mongols like, what did you like? How what fucking you? stupid are you? Like, do you know <laughs> what you just you just had? You had it in your hand, and yet now it's gone because of this stupid kid. You I, fought I, your I, life I, and I, death for this. It's like it was. I fought my fight fight to gain his power was just as much worthy to give the waste on this kid's life as it was to try and use it to stop you. In other words, the fight was worth it either way. There was a there was a fun exchange that happened. Well, not exchange. I didn't. I did not engage. But there was somebody <laughs> after, somebody after that got really mad <laughs> that that he had that Superman did that that he had this insane power. Why? And, and he that he used it on some, and he even the guy even said online like use on some nobody like almost almost quoted Mongol again. I'm like, <laughs> dude, please try to get the point. Like, go back it's and read like, it. Like, 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 it's basically it's the Lex Luthor mindset. The people who cannot see the good because their own minds they feel no one would do that. It's that whole notion of when Beck and Burn stuff. He was it, it, you had a scientist figure out Clark Kent was Superman. Right, it was in the first couple issues, and he's like. It's of course it makes sense. Of course it does to a machine. But then he's like, Superman is a godlike figure. No one would want to hide as a mere mortal because in his mind he thinks that's not that's impossible. And it's that type of thing. That's what I think about. Whenever I see someone says, "If I had Superman's powers, I'd be a jerk," I'm like, "So you're Lex Luthor, in other words." Well, that's 
that's my mindset of it. If they feel luckily, luckily it's all made up, <laughs> but I, but I well, wanted to, made, yeah, I would not want someone like that to have Superman's power. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But no, I, there was the thing about that, uh, that beat. Um, we were always trying to get back to the thing. Like there was a thing way earlier. I mean, Superman could have, could have, um, you know, taken everybody out, like taking out the bad guys from the, from the jump. If he'd been willing to destroy the star forges that were keeping him weak. I mean, right. he was he was still radiation poison, but he he still had some power. And if he could, you know, destroy the star forges that were creating that artificial red sun under, you know, in, in this you know underneath the you know in in, in Engine City One and War World, mm-hmm. then he would he would have a huge amount of power. And you know Apollo too, but oh, Superman yeah. kept saying like, no, 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 no. If you do that, you know, these things are You're keeping it together. We're going to kill thousands of people. You know, mm-hmm. that's, not, that's not worth it. And Midnight is like, so what? That's, you know, we'll win. It will kill thousands of your enemies. Who gives a shit? Exactly. And, and, oh, I love like, it. No, it, it, it is not an option. You know, like exactly. in, in, in the end where Natasha and Leoneth and Orphan and Darling managed to, um, you know, change the, the red sun to a white sun that then powers up, that supercharges Superman. Then we well, that really, was a new one too. Yeah, white sun. I never saw about because I know about blue sun. Never thought about white sun before. Yeah, I mean, it was just the the point of it was like you know you had the power all along. Like it's it, Superman, you know by by doing the right thing, Superman earns the win at the end. Exactly. I love those type of stories where you think you're at your bottom, but it turns out just that simple selfless act is enough to turn the tides in your favor in ways you never would have dreamed of. Yeah, so now Superman is actually more powerful than ever, and wow. we're going we're, we're to see that start to come to fruition in the book coming forward. I, I, uh, I had a really great conversation. I was just in the UK for a while, for about six weeks. Right. Um, first for, for work with my, my army gig, but then I took a week after that to see friends. I got a lot of friends over there. Mm-hmm. Um, got to hang out with Grant for the first time in person. Which oh, nice. Really cool, and hung out with Rom V and Dan Waters oh, and, nice. and, and Tasman and... Um, uh, Jane and Michaela Laird and like just a lot of friends of mine from, from the comics scene mm-hmm. um, did some signings and stuff. And while I was over there, I had this great conversation with Alfie, another guy on mm-hmm. who, who runs the, the channel uh, geeks for fun. Ah, And Alfie is a huge Superman fan, but also is majorly in the uh, anime and manga scene. Ah, And um, knows a lot about that stuff that I frankly don't. I'm just not as up on and and understandable. Pretty, pretty uh, ignorant. I'm I'm pick and choose with with manga for me. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty ignorant of it. There's a lot. I mean, I've I've found some things that I like, but I'm I'm very much a a novice. Right. And um, Alfie made some really interesting observations about like Western versus uh, manga, Western comics versus manga, and how action scenes are written and uh, sometimes when fight scenes in big two comics get a little punchy and the kind of mm-hmm. boring and predictable compared to things that you could do. And that really kind of got me thinking about how to handle action scenes in uh, action going forward. Mm-hmm. So here's to you, Alfie. I'm going to kind of be uh, trying out some, some more experimental things going forward mm-hmm. uh, along the, as I, as I continue to explore manga and anime, I'm going to try to take, you know, take the pages out of that book that I think serves <laughs> Superman well. Nice. Now, of course, what's War World done? Now, is it safe to presume that the stuff with um in Dark Crisis and all that is happening after Superman leaves, but before he got back to Earth? Because given how Justice League seventy five, he's still um you know around War World. So, are we supposed to assume that, or is there a definitive point of time of where what where events happen and fit? I mean, there is, I probably shouldn't say, cause I, I okay. don't want to, there's, it all gets sorted out in the, in the pages and I don't okay. want to. Okay. Wanna, that's I, fair. Um, that's fair. That's fair. You don't need yeah, to I wanna make sure I don't step in it. Yep. All right. So there is a definitive explanation. All right. Yeah. There's a way that it all works out. So there are times in comics where it seems like, cause you know, books come out every month and sometimes mm-hmm. it seems like they don't agree. Right. But a lot of times the timeline kind of gets sorted out after an event or after something else comes out, you know, right. another month or two, and then you kind of put the pieces together after the fact. Because we're, you know, we're telling, if you're just reading action comics, you're reading one linear story. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to just assume that everyone reading action is also reading Dark Crisis and everything right. else. 
I'm just, we're trying to make it all work within the pages of action. Mm -hmm. Dark crisis, Josh doing the same thing in dark crisis. He's trying to make everything work in dark crisis. Right. When it's all done there, you know, if you know, people will kind of put the pieces together on the board and figure out how it fits. Right. If you, because, if you, yeah. if you give a shit about that stuff, but yeah, it's, um, yeah. but it's not going to necessarily happen in chronological order. Like as you know, according to release dates, it doesn't always work. Gotcha. I gotcha. I just asked that because we already have that flashpoint beyond number five. That's gotten everyone confused saying, wait, they're referencing dark crisis. It's spoiling dark crisis. And it's like, uh, what? <laughs> you know, yeah, so, no, it'll make sense after it's all done. Okay, that's good to hear. So you're, then you're le leading into Return of kal -Lau. Now, without giving too much spoilers, could you at least give a elevator pitch of what we should expect from that art, that crossover with um, Son of kal -El? Well, I think the term crossover is a little stronger than than uh, than you should take from it. It's oh. they they reference each other. Cross through, in other words. Yeah, kind of like they they kind of they reference each other a bit, but it's I mean the action issues and the Seneca L issues pretty much stand alone. If you're only reading one or just the other, you can continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you'll get a, a more complete picture if you read both sides of it. Plus the right. special, like a special issue coming out with a bunch yep. of short. It's like a basically an anthology of uh, of Superman like Welcome Home kind of stories. Like mm -hmm. you've been getting back and meeting up with Batman for the first time or the Justice League. Right. Or whoever. Um, yeah, so that's what that special is. And they all, you know, all those stories kind of tell their own stories and they, they pass through each other, but don't feel like you got to hit everything. It's, it's, um, a couple different stories happening at once, but the, um, they, there's kind of some dominoes getting lined up right now where return of Kal-El, kal, -El, kal -El returns rather, um, sets up action 1050, which is this huge landmark issue. And then 1050 sets up what comes after that. And I, I can't spoil that yet, sadly. But Action 1050 is going to be a huge fucking deal. I can tell you that. I can't wait for that. I mean, I hope there's more. How many pages is it supposed to be in that book? I don't. I think they announced it, but I forgot what they said it was. Um, The main story is 40. Ooh, nice. There's a 40-page main story. Mm -hmm. And I forgive me, I forget if there are backups in that one. I don't think there are. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I, don't, like, I don't think there are backups in that one. I could be wrong. I'm but, looking uh, it up right now. Oh, no, it's, it's a 48 page story. So if there is backup, there's probably just a few small store pages. Yeah, something. But um, anyway, it's an extremely eventful book mm -hmm. and it sets up um, these arcs. It, it, 1050 and then 1051. Um, set up an, a new era of Superman comics. Like I'm, that's not an exaggeration. I know people like people say like big bang bombastic things about about comic arcs and stuff because you know we're all just trying to sell books and. Mm -hmm. um, but it's man, it, it's true though, dude. This this one is super super big, and mm -hmm. it, kind of, it kind of resets the whole board in Metropolis in a in a hugely impactful way. Can't and, wait. Um, we're also getting a new artist starting at starting. Or I'm getting a new artist with 1051 that I cannot announce yet because it's not like it's all super fresh. Um, but it's going to look. I, I cannot be more excited. It's going to look unbelievably cool. Yep. Um, and I'm I'm writing every page with this artist in mind. So, mm -hmm. dude, just nice. be excited. It's going to be dope as hell. Yep. Now I've known. Now I went through a bunch because I've been in a bit of a Planet of the Apes move, but moved, and I found out you actually did some Planet of the Apes comics at Boom. And yeah. um, first of all, how was it working on that? And are you going to at all try and pitch anything to Marvel since they have the rights now to do anything for them? Or I actually didn't know that they got the Planet of the Apes right. A Apes yeah. Right now? Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Do. Um, I don't know, man. I, honestly, it's kind of a bandwidth issue right now. So right now, I'm doing I'm doing Alien, I'm doing Superman, I'm doing Bond. Right. And I have a creator owned coming together. I got a, mm -hmm. a, a, um, a kid's book coming together. <laughs> like it's <laughs> okay. A, in other words, you don't want to get too. Oh, yeah, wow, but. I'm stretched a little thin. And honestly, I've, um, I, I love writing franchise books. I, I, do, I really do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's for reasons I described just, uh, really helps me get into the weeds and get to know characters and not just the main characters I'm writing, but also get to know the, their whole cast and the rogues gallery and all that and i love just yep. becoming more well-rounded as a comic writer and getting a more complete experience and given you know just learning how to give readers better stories 
but I also, I did, I did let myself get a little bit, um, out of, out. out of bell. Well, out of balance with, uh, license versus creator owned books. Mm -hmm. Um, the most recent creator owned stories I've done were the last God and kill a man, which both came out right. on like a year ago, something like that. A year and a half. They're like about, they're about. Yeah. And I mean, I've been having a fucking killer time since then on my license stuff. I love everything I'm working on, but mm -hmm. I, I do need to carve out some time to get back to these other stories that I, that are just dying to, to get told. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably won't be pitching playing the apes just yet. I, um, I do love that, that whole universe, especially, I mean, I, I have a lot of affection for the old ones, mostly mm -hmm. the, mostly the original. Yeah. I also really love the new ones. Honestly. Oh I'm, yeah. Oh yeah. I think, honestly, I think I prefer the new ones. I mean, the old ones are, are so different and they definitely have so their different. place. I would like and, to see though, I would love to see someone do the new one, but actually show us what it's like when we get to the events of the first movie, like tell us, how the events of the first movie play out in this new timeline? I would love to see someone do it because I don't think they're going to do a movie of that anytime soon. So I'd love to see someone do that. I think, they, I think they've told the story they want to tell. I mean, I say that knowing right. that, I mean, Cash is King. And if they feel like, if they think that they have another take, if Matt Reeves has another movie that he wants to tack on. Yeah. I think I'm they'll okay. let him. <laughs> he said he's told, that's the funny thing. He only did the second and third one. He didn't do the first one, but he's now defined it at the point where you have people think he did do the first one. And then you're like, wait, he didn't do the first one? Nope. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he just, yeah, these, these new movies are so great. And I, oh, yeah. I kind of hate for them to get messed up with another story. Like I, I kind of, right. I want them, I want them to just exist just like they are forever. Oh yeah. Well, that's why I say we do. Well, that's why you have thousands of years to jump forward where, you could easily just say, oh, that's a possible future is what I'm saying. So, because they did hint off that Tyler and the others took off in Rise. And for all we know, they was saying, oh, it's going to happen eventually. Right. Yeah, I mean, the story that I wrote, um, I only wrote one, like, 20-ish, 22-something page yep. story for Boone. Uh, yep, um, the, time of, the Time of Man. Yeah, yeah. And it was um, a story about... About the son, the son who likes to uh, C um, Caesar. No, it's about oh, no. the it's oh. about the the human son uh, oh, right. from the from the second film who draws a lot. Oh yeah, that one. Yes. Yeah, it's about him growing older. Like he's gotten a little bit older, and he's found mm -hmm. some other like and there's like four survivors that live out in the cabin in the middle of nowhere, yeah. and they just keep to themselves, and everything's fine. Yep. But then, but then an ape shows up. And everything oh, changes, no. and then we see we see the best and worst of all those survivors kind of come out, and everything it changes the whole dynamic. Um, it's just a very a very character driven story, but I'm very proud of it. That's it was meant to be kind of like a little love letter to those newer films, and also mm -hmm. uh, to, to a character I really loved. I like that character. That I love the, uh, the kid who draws and the relationship that he forms with the uh, the, the big orangutan. Um, what's his name? Oh, again, it's been a while since I've watched through yeah, that. Yeah, I forget the character's name now, but they kind of forged this little bond over the guys, over the kids' drawings. Uh, was it, it uh, Alexander was the kid's name, wasn't it? Uh, I don't remember, honestly. Uh, yeah, from Dawn, from Dawn, correct? Um, yeah, yeah, yes. I was just thinking uh, as the uh, the ape's name. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, so it was, that story was kind of a love letter to... Um... Oh, and there, there's also a girl character in it who was meant to be um the young kid from oh, Maurice Maurice was the orangutan exactly Maurice I do remember Maurice's name yeah. there's, a young, there's a girl in the movie that's meant to be sorry in my story that's meant to be the, the young girl from the third film ah um but they the fox was like no no can't say that it's her and um <laughs> Gee, why not but, yeah I know but under you know so we um but in my head canon that's who it is <laughs> Right. I, just, I, I like the idea that these characters kind of found each other, not knowing about their roles in the, the whole thing. Yep. Now, well, I think when I last had you on, we talked about this, but it's been so long I forgot, so I might be repeating questions, but Marble Zombies Resurrection. Yeah. Where, where did that idea come about from? I, again, I'm pretty sure I asked you this, but might as well re-ask. Well, uh, Marvel had gotten word that Kirkman was about to cancel, not cancel, sorry, was about to <laughs> end... Uh, abruptly ends the walking dead series mm -hmm. and um i gather that they wanted to kind of piggyback on that news with mm -hmm. uh, a revamp of their 
Marvel Resurrection series. Oh, sorry, Marvel's Marvel Zombies. Zombies. And they asked me if I wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. And um, I, my only thing at Marvel at that time had been this one 10 page war story, but it had gone very well. I was super proud of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they came to me. I, I don't know. I guess Ricky Purden, I guess he's like, he was their talent guy at the time. Mm-hmm. He said, um, I don't know if it was him that, that put me over the edge or what they reached, but um, Jordan White reached out about it. I was like, Hey, would you want to do this? I'm like, fuck yes, I would. However, I admit <laughs> the, the Kirkman take Mm-hmm. On Marvel Zombies is kind of not the take that I would do. It's not really my brand. It felt very campy and fun, and just kind of like a just a fun little zombie romp, right? Meant to kind of go just like a lot of visual gags and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to I wanted to do like a Cormac McCarthy The Road kind of take on Marvel Zombie, like a a very dark zombie story with our heroes kind of surviving in this you know this crazy place. And they had they. They had a few little details that they passed on. They were like, we want it to be like a flash forward kind of thing where we see the world after it's become what it is. And we want, um, you can't kill Spider-Man. If you're, if, <laughs> if but you, I, well, after what happened in the first one, I don't blame them, you know. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They, we're like, we, you're, welcome, you're, welcome to use, you're welcome to use Spider-Man, but if you do, he can't get turned. He can't turn into a zombie. You can't kill him. Been there, um, done that. I get it. Can't be, it can't be a zombie, I guess. I don't think it said I couldn't kill him, but he couldn't be a zombie. Again, been there, done that. I get that in their eyes. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had a few little, you know, caveats, not caveats, but like just little, few little ground rules. Right. And in fact, there was a cover. This is a little insider baseball. There's that really awesome, um, oh, my God, what's the artist's name who did the cover? Um, oh, uh, I worked with him so much. I'm drawing uh, I'm double checking. Oh, uh, Inhook Lee. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a really iconic cover of Wolverine, Deadpool, yep. and some resurrection else. Um, one shot to cover. Or whatever. And yep. that Deadpool was originally Spider-Man. Oh, and they said no, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't think he'd I don't think he'd been given any direction. And, and they were like, oops, Spider-Man, you can't use him. Change him to something else. Deadpool. So became, that was quick. Yeah, made him Deadpool, yeah. But originally that was gonna be Spider-Man's face. Right. Um of course you also worked on Extreme Carnage. How did that one come about? No, they reached out and they, they I mean, out. I think they, when was that? That was after Marvel Zombies was out. That had also gone very well. Yep. This was in um, tw- um, 2021. This was right after, um, like they were pr- they're pretty much wrapping up, you know, um, Donnie Cates' Venom stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They wanted to use Carnage somehow. And um, Devin Lewis reached out and Devin was, was an, an editor in the spider office. Mm-hmm. We did not work together, but I guess you heard something good from somebody and reached out and I was like, yeah, dude, I'll get into that. I mean, I, and um, again, I mean, honestly, kind of similar to uh, our conversation on Marvel Zombies. I was like, is it cool to do this different take? Because I, I mean, I'd seen enough one dimensional, you know, Carnage kills everyone kind of pitch where he's just like, Carnage shows up and just, just slaughters everybody. And it's kind of, yeah, kind of not much to it. Um, we've already seen that. Um, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to do another one, so right. I was like, so I pitched them an idea that was essentially this, the Marvel symbiotes meet the Manchurian Candidate, mm. where it's like a, like a political thriller. This is mm-hmm. right. This is they pit they pitched me. They asked me to do Extreme Carnage like right after January sixth, right. And as a soldier, who and, and a musician who sometimes plays at the Capitol, right. Um, that was all very fresh in my mind. It was a big deal to me. Right. And I was like, what if we did like a entry in Canada kind of take and just did a told a because I mean, in every story, I try to tell a story that matters to me. Right. Like, uh, but dressed up in like genre trappings that kind of make it really fun and exciting and cool to look at visually. And um, so, yeah, I was like, let's let's do a different take on it. Let's make it like a political thriller um, with like a like a spy versus spy type thing where you've got a, the team of symbiotes kind of coming together. But you've also got like a team of like a hit squad of, of symbiotes kind of going after him. They kind of meet, kind of meet, uh, kind of, it all kind of comes to a head around this, around a, a rebooted friends of humanity, like the friends of humanity from the X-Men books kind of revamps in a different way in a very anti alien way that made sense to me in the wake of King and black, because right. I mean, the King and black brings about basically puts like a symbiote shell around the earth. Mm-hmm. So symbiotes are like out there. Everyone knows about sim- Like every human being knows about symbiotes now. Right. And in a way that scares the shit out of everybody. 
So mm -hmm. a group like the Friends of Humanity in the wake of something like that seems to me would be a perfect fit. Right. Because they're like this iconic, you know, villainous organization from the old days that I that made a big impression on me as a kid reading X-Men comics back back when everyone like if you weren't reading X-Men back then when I was a kid, you were human shit. Right. <laughs> Every, you just had to be reading X-Men. Joe Mad was drawing it and Jim Lee was drawing it and the, the, the stories were awesome. Um, and like, and um, Sabretooth and um, Graydon Creed. Graydon, right? Graydon was the, was the Victor, was the, um, Sabretooth's son that ended up running for president and all that. Right. Is that his name, Graydon Creed? I think so, yeah. He, he was like a poster boy for uh, Friends of Humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it'd be a cool time to see the Friends of Humanity kind of make a comeback in a way that felt organic and true to the events of King and Black. Mm -hmm. And um, they went for it. So we kind of had two teams of symbiotes kind of coming to a head around this whole Friends of Humanity resurgence. and Because um, Carnage wants to build on all of that, that fear and rage and every, all the all the differences, you know? Right. And I had this, um, I had this kind of, because the last, the last we had seen of Carnage in the story, he was basically like a fish in the ocean or something. He was like basically nothing, reduced to almost nothing in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had this visual image of Carnage slowly working his way up the food chain. Right. From like this little, this little glob of nothingness in the bottom of the ocean floor and gets a fish. Mm -hmm. and the fish strikes a shark, like, shark like, a, like a torpedo and turns the shark the shark attacks this boat of Somali pirates and eats one of the guys. And you see the guy walking out of the ocean and you see him, you know, meeting up with his, his warlord that kind of funds him. And there's a CIA guy there. Mm -hmm. and, and then the CIA guy is on a plane back to, back to Washington. And you kind of see him working his way up the food chain of earth up until he gets to like Washington DC. And now he's in politics. Right. Um, so I don't know. It was just a really fun take that's different that I'd never seen done before in a Carnage book. And uh, they let me do it. And it was it wasn't just me writing that whole series. They let me kind of show run a group of writers, super great writers too, like Steve Orlando, mm -hmm. um, Clay McLeod Chapman, Alyssa Wong. And they all of us got two issues. I did the bookends and we all kind of steered the we had these little group meetings where we talked about the direction and it was super fun. Mm -hmm. And those writers are all terrific. All the artists did, did a great job. It was it was just really rewarding. Definitely. And um, yeah, that was an interesting thing. And of course, what's the whole point to bring? And so they see they felt like, okay, we killed up Carnage. It's been a little while. Let's bring him back. Yeah. Well, I don't think. I mean, his death in his quote unquote death in King of Black was not meant to stick. I mean, right. Yeah, they, they killed him before that. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's it is complicated because. They legit killed like uh, Cletus Cassidy is like. Oh yeah, he was gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's like he's not even uh, around. He's not even like uh, a bad basically. Come up with a way to keep him around, huh? Yeah, it's it's luckily the way that Donny Cates kind of did the lore, the of codex the, and all the, that. The yeah, right. The symbiote stuff that he wrote kind of gave us an out, like a, a way to kind of bring Cletus sort of back. Because I mean, I was. I can't imagine a carnage without Cletus, you know, it's just, he's right. just so he's such an integral part of who carnage is. Right. I mean, I know Ram B took over and had to be, they went their separate way. So apparently yeah, he I, I mean, yeah, the, the initial story was that, that, um, that politician's son, like we were kind of setting up the politician to be the bad guy, like mm -hmm. the, the Trump analog kind of, but then right. It ends up being his son, like, who's supposedly kind of meek and getting kicked around, who's actually the scary one. Right. And the idea was for him to actually be the new, the new symbiote all along. Nice. Um, and um, it ended up not going that way. We ended up kind of just making it, you know, kind of, you know, Carnage just kind of flies away, and we we don't know where he lands, which opened us up for that one shot that we did after that. Right. But um, it's still, I, it would have been fun to have that, to have that politician kid be uh be the new carnage kind of yeah i don't know it would have been really cool but we ended up going a different way right and then of course you have your aliens book we can wrap up talking about that and how you basically i know you also in word balloon you said how you had salvador la Roca for a long time and then when it was decided to change artists you started to start over another um no i guess you, you guys going by the season format or how you guys want to look at it as yeah kind of seasons i mean it's um the first two 
the first season was one arc basically, but it was it was all kind of defined by Salva's work. Mm-hmm. And we did we did an annual after that. Right. Um, which which is also at the end of that that second arc. Um, mm-hmm. But it all kind of the fact that we're bringing in a new artist for the second for the third arc kind of right. makes it feel like a reset kind of. Um, right. So um, yeah, we wanted to do like the first two arcs are kind of build up the the Whalen Yutani slash you know. Uh, Earth government kind of Cold War sort of building, like between the United Americas primarily and Whale and Yutani, seeing the um, the culture of the synths kind of develop and seeing them become more independent, building towards Alien Resurrection, where we see the one on a writer character where they're they're right. like completely basically like human but better. We're just kind of okay. seeing them on that path and you know, becoming more independent, kind of seeing growing pains as a, as a culture. Mm-hmm. Um, those were kind of the the subplots of of those first two arcs. And now we kind of see a lot of that come to fruition in the third arc that's that's just barely started. Right. And the things that we're going to see come together in the third the third arc is where we see Steel Team. And Steel Team is a, a special ops team of synths, mm-hmm. um, super badass who have kind of gone off the reservation. They're off on their own. Oh boy! And they thought they'd escaped, but. Um, the United Systems, the United Americas in, in alien lore eventually becomes the, the United Systems. Mm-hmm. And by this time in the story, that's what they are. And the United Systems finds Steel Team, brings them out of retirement. They're like, we need you for something. Mm-hmm. You know, we've, just, we've just screwed ourselves big time and we need an alien egg to fix it. Uh-oh. <laughs> so they go down to this place uh, that was once kind of the star in Whalen yutanis crown, like this kind of research and development like colony kind of. Mm-hmm. Where everything has gone horribly wrong, and they need to go down well, there and no. do something back. Yeah, <laughs> so we kind of see the the Whale Nutani versus sovereign government kind of thing come to a head, and you see a more developed version of the synths, which is cool. I never, we have you know see an entire cast that is just synths, the way that like the Hobbit is basically just about all these dwarves, right? Um, so that was kind of cool. And mm-hmm. uh, without spoiling it, we're also going to kind of in, in the very first arc there was the there were these images of what we called the hybrid, Uh-oh. Which, which is this um, like a, a xenomorph slash human hybrid kind of, and we never really find out exactly what she is, but she mm-hmm. looks much more human than other than other um, you know symbiote ish creatures. Sorry, right. you know, I mean xenomorph. Excuse me. <laughs> Um, we were just talking about Venom earlier. I understand. Yeah, yeah. Earlier. That's understandable. Um, people like people took that very di- very different way. Some of them were like, oh, "It's stupid." It looks like it, it was it was meant to be. I wanted to work in as much Giger HR Giger um, imagery as possible into the book because w- to me it just does not feel like Alien without Giger's work. Right. And there are all these images. There's all this artwork that Giger did that has nothing to do with yeah. Alien. And a lot of it was based on his former lover, Lee Tobler, who mm. killed herself very young. She killed herself when she was 27 in, in Tobler's place. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, you know, she inspired a lot of his work. If you look through a lot of the stuff, he did a lot of stuff with her in it while she was alive. Mm-hmm. Like there's images of him painting her body with all this crazy biomechanical stuff that he always right. did. And doing sculptures that look very much like her with all this extra shit on her that made her look super mm-hmm. and crazy. So the um, the synth, sorry, the um, the hybrid that we saw in the first arc was never meant to be a real thing. Mm-hmm. She's like a kind of a warning. Ah. That, it's like a premonition of what's coming for humanity's future. Right. Like oh, you mentioned a hybrid. It kind of reminds me of stuff that now I don't know. I don't. I doubt this was intentional, but something similar they did in the unproduced Alien Three stuff, the William Gibson stuff, where they had something very similar. Was that intentional or just complete coincidence? No, I didn't really rely on that one for the first arc. I relied on the unproduced thing um, a little bit for the second arc for revival, like that mm-hmm. the idea of the colony, like the the low tech colony off world and all that, right. yeah, with the, with the, with religious overtones. Um, oh yeah, but I didn't I didn't rely not on any specifics, just the very general kind of right, pitch right, that has kind of inspired what uh, Alien Revival became. Yep. Now, um, but yep. the um, the hybrid thing that we introduced in the first arc again, it was not it's not an actual character or monster that ever appears on screen. It's, it only right. exists in Gabriel Cruz's nightmares. 
Right. But it's meant to be a premonition of what's coming for humanity. And then, oh, but, it, but, it, but it also kind of lines up with the, um, what they call the abomination in Prometheus. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, where, where those char- one of those characters gets, you know, fucked up by a, by one by the not a face like about one of those snake things the uh hammer hammer peds mm-hmm. and becomes something different and then we see him later we see him getting changed by the the accelerant by the by the hammer peed. right and you see him becoming this otherworldly thing and um mm-hmm. that like the idea of the hybrid kind of goes hand in hand with that we're going to see that kind of idea sort of come to fruition in the third arc as well yep now Two, there are two other questions I just want to ask before we start wrapping up, and they both deal with aliens. How tempted now it's Marvel's I take it Marvel's being much like Star Wars absolute no intersection with any other universe, right? Except for probably the Predator, I'm assuming, right? Um it hasn't really come up because I haven't wanted to. Right. Um so yeah, I'm not asking that. Uh, you know, if I if we try to have a page turn and Han Solo shows up, I'm sure they would have something to say. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but as far as a yeah. predator, now that they're, that tile's getting off the ground, do you ever plan on doing anything with that? Um, I don't know what I should say about that. I probably, I mean, not really. I the thing is, I'm I'm such a massive alien fan that, and I love I love predators too. Oh yeah, um, like the, um, yeah, I I think they're both awesome franchises. Both franchises. Um, to me, they kind of cheapen each other when they're brought together. All um, right. Now, only as a as a writer, I mean, I mean, right. when I when I see a good Alien versus Predator story, great, mm-hmm. great. But um, as a writer, I can understand that, especially because when you think about it, the predators are usually the dominant factor of those stories. If you don't have any humans, there's always the predators that dominate, and the aliens are just the monsters. There's, yeah. I mean, if they came to me, the thing is, like, I'm not going to bring Predator into Alien kind of just for no reason. It would it would be because it was an Alien versus Predator book. And if they were to ask me to do an AVP book, mm-hmm. I would I would think long and hard about it. I would probably end up saying yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just I love Alien so much, dude. And I love Predator, too. But Alien has my heart. Right. And I um, I would have it would be an it would be an, a really intriguing challenge because mm-hmm. um. Honestly, James Bond is kind of the same for me because I, I was never like, James Bond never like changed my life, you know. Like I, I, I have my versions of of Bond that I like very much, mm-hmm. um, but I always want I wanted to see him be like a legit spy, you know. Like I, I took the Bond gig because there are things I really wanted to do with that story. I was like, what if we did this? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not like me trying to do my version. Like when I'm when I'm writing Alien, I'm trying to make it feel just like the movies because mm-hmm. I love those movies, you know. When I'm trying to do, when I write Bond, I'm I'm hitting all the same beats that Bond fans want to see. You know, we've got the the celebration of the gadgets and just his awesome yep. sense of style and coolness. He just defines what cool is. Every word he says is so cool. Mm-hmm. Um, he's this unstoppable killer. But you know, women love him, and like this, oh, this is yeah. there's this whole male fantasy thing. Yep. But you've got to hit all those things. Like the, the villain has to have some kind of a theatrical element, visual theatrical element to them. There are there are things you gotta to hit to make it to make a bond story what it is. Definitely. But there's also other things I wanted to bring into it that make it new. I want to make it feel more like I you never see Bond being a spy. If Bond was an actual spy, he's the he's the worst spy. Exactly. Ever. I mean, there's my no. One or two moments in a movie where that's happened, but that's just it. I think Mission Impossible has been more spy-like than Bond. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. I want to see him being more. I want to see more subtlety. I want to see more fighting from the shadows, like sneaking mm-hmm. around, like being being clever, not just being not just blowing stuff up. Um, exactly. So we're we're kind of make, we're doing like a more Ed Brubaker slash like John Le Carre kind of version mm-hmm. of of Bond with this new arc. Very if good. I were, if I were going to be doing an AVP story. It would be a similar kind of thing where I would be, I would approach it like, how do we make the best possible version of this thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for jo- for coming back on again, Phil. This was just so great. I mean, again, the Superman story, I'm going to keep rereading that for a long time in the future. Mm-hmm. And I have very few stories where I'm like that. Or some just stay on my shelf and gather dust. Yours, I'll be rereading for in the future i know thanks so much brother i appreciate that the superman stories that come out soon like we're going to be like really playing the classics for a while like i now that we're people have like stuck with me through this whole war world thing 
mm-hmm. and like let me tell this gigantic story that's very unlike anything we ever see from Superman. And and now I want to kind of reward everyone for that by like now here's the Superman that you know and love, the version of Superman that you just saw, where he's like the yep. most inspirational version of himself. Mm-hmm. We're gonna we're gonna see that in Metropolis where he belongs. We're gonna see the the Kryptonification of Metropolis. We're gonna see Metropolis right. become the city of tomorrow. We're gonna see. Um, we're kind of blow out the villains and really make them all really interesting and complicated and dark the way that we did with Mongol. We're going to do that with Metallo. Mm-hmm. The one after Metallo is going to be even cooler. I, it's just, I'm so I, can't wait. I cannot wait. Actually, actually, one more question I want to ask. John's sure. vision of his dad's death. Has that passed now or is that still on the table? I mean, we don't know for sure, but in in my head canon, that's passed. Like it's, when All he right. comes when he comes home and the events of the story that we see, mm-hmm. uh, the timeline has been changed, and now Superman is home safe. Like All that right. was not according to John's, according to what John saw when he was in the future, that shouldn't have happened. All right, that's what yeah. I thought. I just wanted to make sure on that one because. That was always something that I laid over my head. And, of course, you had so many people kept thinking, oh, he's going to kill Superman. I still loved. No, I that, still love your, no, I don't you pot, took pot shots. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, sure. That's exactly what happened. Hey, guys, no, I'm going to kill him. I mean, I don't. Um, I haven't heard any noise about the copyright stuff in a long time. But whenever you see stuff like that about copyright, just know that it's not true. I know. It's, I know. It's, um, DC I mean, owns it until it goes into public domain, which they can't change it then. But until yeah, then, yeah. everything sure, I'm sure a lot of those people believe what they're saying. I'm not saying that they're not like deliberately lying to you, but if but it's not like, I would know if that was the case. If right. there was some kind of a mandate, like you've got to do this or we're going to get screwed. That's not, that's not happening. So and, and don't it, worry about that. anyway, because they still have the old stuff. They'd have to stop printing the old stuff if they really wanted to stop yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to be an, an expert on copyright, but I know that, yeah, if, <laughs> there are zero conversations about that happening right now. So right. don't worry about it. So again, no, Phil, thank you so much and cannot wait to see where, you know, things coming. I cannot wait for what's coming up in the future. And from what you just said, your plans are, I'm even more excited as a Superman fan. Thanks so much, Robert. And to all of Robert's listeners and, and viewers know that Robert was super patient getting me on this show. And I am, I apologize for being hard to read. Hey, hey it worked um, that out better for the best because it came out after everything wrapped up. What if, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We were able to talk yeah. about the complete story. Well, thanks again for your patience. I really appreciate it. Yep, no worries. And we'll see you all on the next one. All right, man, take care.